Um, good. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, on this one, we'll take questions. So if you have questions, there's a microphone here. And I think jo Joseph is running around, potentially, if you have questions. There he is. Um, so just raise your hand to him, and then he, 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 will, he will help you. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question uh, that you know already. Why is sustainability important to you or to your organization? And I don't know who to start with. I start with Vibren. Oh, thanks, Max. Um, and nice to be here. Why is it important? Uh, a bank like uh, ABN AMRO that I work for uses a lot of software, uh, uses a lot of IT, and digitalization is key, as you are all aware. So if we look at the met reality in our own operations, like we now have to for the CSRD, you will find that you have to look at, if you want to green uh, your own operations or make the impact less, you have to look at IT. So it's because it's such a dominant factor in your own operations, basically. That's a good one. That brings me to Laurie. Is how big of a factor is IT at, in, in Airbus's uh, footprint? I wouldn't say it is as big as, uh, as in a bank. And this is why usually the bank sector and insurance sector is uh, really the the one pushing into that direction. In the production, we have other challenges. Uh, nevertheless, we are in a complex production uh, which is extremely digitalized, and we are going into that, this uh, digital transformation. And as it was mentioned this morning, uh, we will at some point come to a conflict of usage between this digital transformation, every one of, of us and our companies are going through, and energy transition. We will all go to the same raw materials. We will all need the same metals and minerals. And, and I think it's important to bring the big picture and within the sustainability roadmap of a company that IT has definitely is, uh, is place and work to say. Interesting. And personally, what motivates you to work in sustainability? What would you say? Uh, that I would love to make a, a change that uh, even though the big structures work very slowly when they achieve something they have this uh, this leverage and this this power uh, of uh, of making uh, things change uh, with a big impact and that's really my hope uh, in uh, in IT uh, for for the industry oh, that's a good one thank you now, Kevin, first I think you have to say what Lufthansa Industry Solutions is in one sentence, that people don't think you're, you work at Lufthansa, or you do, but... Yeah, but often I actually introduce myself as working for Lufthansa, but that's not quite true, but everybody just remembers Lufthansa in the end. So I'm working for Lufthansa Industry Solutions. We are an IT consultant company within Lufthansa and the Lufthansa Group. So uh, we are actually focusing on IT and project management and so on only, so as most of you, most uh, I guess, do. And that's why IT and, of course, the footprint of IT and the resources needed is very important to us, as that's our, uh, our key focus. Um, but for me as a person, uh, why is it important to me? Uh, as I'm not a techie, I'm pretty new into the field, about one and a half years now. Um, I started a couple of years ago like with getting this intrinsic motivation by understanding the, like, the complexity and the bigger picture of the of the human actions on our planet. And once you really get like the consequences on a larger scale, I think it's just normal uh, to really start to work against it and tr try to uh, promote initiatives that are restricting the negative consequences. And when I started into IT, like as I said, one and a half years ago, I was really wondering uh, why there isn't any actions Basically, of course, some minor, but uh, the, the topic of sustainability reason really wasn't important and present in IT at all. Even though um, the IT, ICT area on a global scale emits more emissions by now than the aviation industry. And that really um, puzzled me, and that's why it's so important to me. Good one. Now, Laurie, I'm going to start with you with the first question. What, what roadblocks do you see in, in, the larger, in the wider adoption of sustainable IT practices? Like, what's in, in your mind, what's in your way? Well, first of all, nobody knows what that is. <laughs> because, I mean, we know what it is, but uh, these events attract people that knows what it is about. Uh, so awareness, I think we heard it a hundred times this morning. It's, it's the key word. Uh, you have to, uh, to explain again and again what it is about. And it is not in most of the educational programs. When we keep, we, we keep receiving new IT students uh, in our offices, they have never heard about it. And for me, if you don't start in, at the education level, you cannot hope 
that the company of tomorrow is working on it. So I think that's, for me, one of the main uh, ro roadblocks. And um, then we are being driven by a very few but very powerful IT companies which have very strong business model that are not that sustainable. And we just take it for granted in IT and we just go along the flow uh, was it uh, without knowing about uh, the data, without really having transparency on uh, what they do exactly and what is the impact when you use their services? And I think that this lack of transparency and data about it, uh, it's another, uh, another roadblock. My favorite word, transparency. <laughs> Vibhun, what about you? What, what roadblocks do you see? Yeah, Lo Laurie meant a few good ones. I mentioned a few good, good ones. I would like to still add also culture to it. I think in IT, we, we've been used over the past decades, IT is still a young sector, right? Uh, to work on functionality and on time to market eh, and on all these and uh, latest and greatest technologies that are out there. So, and, and IT people, developers or other roles are being appreciated for delivering functionality to business fast. Eh, and, um, and I think they should also be appreciated for, for, for delivering it with a low footprint. And uh, this is kind of a new paradigm and, and a new challenge eh? and also a culture shift, you could say, or paradigm shift, that, that this is also part of the challenge now. It's not only about uh, uh, speed or, or technology. It's also about the trade-offs uh, to make and, and the consequences to, uh, to maintain or to lower. Interesting, yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's a quite a shift. What about you, Kevin? Roadblocks? Yeah, I think most has been said already. Um, first of all, I, I agree. It's about transparency again. It's about KPIs because organizations are used to steer by KPIs. So far, mostly by financial KPIs. Um, so sustainability related KPIs are coming up now, but for IT, as we all know, it's quite hard to get them nowadays, at least in an accurate and um, real-time basis. Another to uh, topic really is the integration um, and the training of our developers, architects, requirements engineers to really get it into their heads because they aren't used to do so. Of course, um, as we have heard um, before, uh, I don't know who said it, but they have so much on their plate already um, that they are working hours and hours after, after business and uh, end of business. And it really has to be integrated, has to become an automatic uh, mechanism to really think about it and see the opportunities that, which are already there. We've got the technology, we just don't use it in the right way. Gibbon, I'm curious, I know that some of your team members are here from, from the development side. How do, you, how do you solve that problem with them? How do you make them aware? How do you help them have the tools in place to, to, to really do something? Yeah, the, the team members who are here today, because uh, within Ebenemro we now have a small team on sustainable IT, uh, but the team members who are here today, uh, I did not have to motivate them. Eh? So typically the first team members you encounter on this topic are the ones that are intrinsically motivated. Eh? So uh, I think it, it is how, if you further want to spread it into the other 8,000 people working in IT within, uh, within the bank, uh, that is where you need other tactics or, or hacks or education and awareness programs to, uh, to make that happen. Although, indeed, I think a lot of people are intrinsically motiv motivated, uh, but they just want to know how can I contribute and am I allowed to contribute and will I be, be uh, appreciated or maybe even rewarded, if you want, for, for contributing. Uh, so, but the, the group here today, I, I think I, I hardly had to motivate them. They motivate themselves, yeah. That's good. What about you, Laurie? How do you embed the sustainable IT thinking throughout your organization and promote it? Um, I'm also, uh, before I forget to say it, Gilo reminded me later, uh, earlier of the digital collage. Maybe that's also something uh, worth. Yeah, the digital collage and even the, the, the climate risks. So I think before even talking about sustainable IT, you have to make sure that people know what sustainability is about. It's not a new buzzword. It's not replacing environment. It encompasses not only environment, but also uh, people and prosperity. And, and people don't know what sustainability is and or climate change. So this uh, climate frests is a very um, interesting workshop to put cards together and really see what the human activities are really uh, provoking in terms of, uh, of, of, of effects on, on CO2 emissions and what does it bring on, on this additional greenhouse gas effect on the planet, uh, etc. So it's about the basics. Then when the basics are set, we have a, 
a list of trainings in our online learning platform where people can at least get an awareness of what sustainable IT is about. Uh, they can also go deeper into eco-design of digital services or life cycle assessment of digital services if they want to be more uh, in the details. Um, we did a carbon balance footprint of our IT so that we have numbers to show. Okay, this is what we produce as IT, but this is what we produce in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, and I think with facts and figures and talking again and again about a topic, that's how you make uh, the topic go everywhere in, uh, in the organization. Yeah, I'm sure facts and figures help. I have one question coming in. I'll, I'll I would say upstream emissions and like how the IT creates, you know, damage. But software creates a huge benefit when it's applied like into saving CO2 emissions. I suppose like in the banks, easy example with online banking, you limit the amount of buildings that you need for banks and then the displacements to go to the bank. So my question is, in your activities, do you also account for, I guess this is scope three emissions, do you also account for, or are you planning to, and how are you going to do it, um, for the benefit of the use of software on the scope three, like the, the, the opportunities that you have there, and maybe you can have to make compromises into having less green IT on the upstream, which is not so, the impact is not so high, but the positive impact is higher once it comes to the market. I don't know how you see it. I can take this question very quickly if you want. I mean, I can answer, maybe you can ad adjust a bit. Um, that's a very good question, actually. Like, uh, the Green Software Foundation divides it between greening off and greening by IT, so what's the benefit and what's the harm of IT? And uh, it's very important um, to communicate it this way because IT, as we all know, that's why we work in the field, is a very interesting and beneficial field of action. Um, but it's just important to at least be aware of the negative effects. Um, I think everybody here knows that the benefits of IT in an ecological way are uh, outpacing the harms, currently at least, by, by much. Um, so we don't have actual KPIs in our communication, so what is the actual benefit right now? Uh, that's the way we have to go to, that's where we are heading to. Um, but uh, it's, I think, for the beginning, that's again the point of awareness and transparency, but uh, first of all, awareness, um, not to like, communicate IT as the devil, but still as a solution which has its downsides, and that has, just has to, become, uh, has to be taken into perspective. So uh, functional requirements and non-functional requirements regarding uh, sustainability have to be combined. But to measure it, that's quite hard actually for us at the moment. People, I think you also wanted to jump in, at least you had to. Yeah, because you referred to banking, huh? so uh, indeed, uh, and, and uh, sure, banking has been on the forefront of digitalization, uh, closing offices and, and moving to, 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 to digital and to IT, basically, right, and apps and websites, and, and you can look at it from an environmental perspective and say, well, it's, it's better to have it digitalized and have all those offices around uh, the country, and you could make that carbon uh, comparison or carbon case. Uh, uh, you could also look more from the social side. Eh? So, uh, is everybody now still access, has access to financial services? I know my mother, a bit older by now, still finds it very difficult to work uh, on, a, on a tablet or in, her, uh, in, in an app to do her, her banking uh, services, right? So, I, I think from a social side, my, maybe those offices are, are still quite needed uh, for a certain time. But if you compare IT within our own operations, uh, like I said, it's material. It's actually nearly half of our total footprint now stems from IT or digitalization. And um, so we live in the, in the now and we, we look to the future and then we also only see this growing at the moment. Eh? So this is a challenge that uh, b before you know it, IT by itself already exceeds all those hundreds of offices we had in the past. Eh? And uh, I think uh, maybe we should go back to paper then, which is of course a joke, but uh, huh? yeah. Hi there. Um, folks, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, in the absence of regulation around software, we've seen various organizations look to using things like internal carbon pricing as a way to create incentives. So Microsoft have an internal carbon levy, Wikipedia have an internal carbon price, even Shell, an oil company, has an internal carbon price. I would be curious about your thoughts on internal carbon pricing and if you've had any experience applying this to this particular problem as a way to create an incentive or shift people's behavior 
towards slightly greener outcomes? I can maybe start. Um, it's a very good question, and it was said already this morning, uh, we will have to put price on the footprint. Uh, it might not be the only means. I hope it will not be the only means, but we'll have to go there. Um, within Airbus, we are on the way, so we have an, inter an internal price of CO2. Uh, we apply it for all big investments, and within IT, for all new investment, we always ask, what is your energy footprint, what's your CO2 footprint, what's your waste? estimated. And the next step uh, in the year, in the coming year, will be to apply this price and really show it. This is the price of your investment, but this is the price of your footprint. And I think it's, uh, it's very necessary uh, to intensify people on, uh, on their project and make them aware again through uh, this exercise and, and the pricing. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to expand on that because it's a good question indeed. And um, so what we've been doing and still progressing on, uh, say maturing, is creating a dashboard that holds all our 3,000 plus applications where we pinpoint and, and, and uh, provide insights to how much energy is an application using and how much carbon is it emitting, both market and location based. And indeed the next step we are now proposing is to put either gamification on top of it or, or pricing or both. Uh, where you incentivize or, or tax if you want. Um, and and, and you, I think you can do both, uh, the carrot and the stick, uh, basically. So, uh, but then we really bring it to the product owners and the DevOps teams involved, so, so they get really, um, let's say, insight in, in their impact uh, and, and the change, changes that they are making, uh, the contributions that they are, are making or not. Eh? If they're moving in the wrong direction, that should also be visible. Um, and we've set KPIs on, uh, on that also, that is already done on, on a sc small scope of applications um, which we will going to um, start um, assessing from 1st of January on next, next year. Yeah. I think we, we have another question. Hi there, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, transparency has been mentioned a few times here as a key pillar of moving forward. Um, I was curious how you see the challenges here when it ties into the privacy of the individual and the privacy of these companies that maybe don't want to be transparent. Yeah, but that's actually a topic we've been challenging in the past t times uh, as we tried to get like a carbon transparency on a project level and that's what uh, li like developing projects. And that included that we needed like at, at least estimations of hours being worked on the product, uh, project productively by our developers. And that's something our, um, what's Betriebsrat in English? Um, uh, your, your unions. Or what's the unions. Uh, they didn't find that very funny actually. Um, because that kind of transparency shouldn't get out of a project and the uh, people who were supposed to deliver us uh, those informations that was just a POC and it uh, didn't go that well as you can uh, sense out of my words. Um, the people really weren't motivated to, to share those inf kinds of information as well. So that really is, is a problem. I think you do have to get these informations from the uh, infrastructure side as Vibrin is doing. I think this approach is really very beneficial because you don't have to go into the detail of the people working in the projects, um, but you get the automated information without going into the, too much into detail of the actual people working on it. Yeah, Shola, go ahead. Um, yeah, as practitioners in industry, what are your key expectations for educational programs to produce graduates that are aware of some of these things? That's a good question. So, so when students come out of universities, what would you like them to know about? Anna will be very happy to hear your answer. Was the question for me, yeah? Yeah, so I think, I hope that we will no longer have to do awareness. Eh? So I think that should be covered in the first place. Um, and actually I see that happening already. So we, we, uh, we have this team now and we have this community within the bank and a lot of young people who join the bank as a developer or on different roles within IT, they actually come knocking on our door say, well, I want to contribute, how can I contribute? So I, I think that awareness in Gen Z or whatever you call it, the, the young, young people nowadays is very, very much there already and they want to contribute. But I, to be, in all honesty, I think most generations want to contribute. Um, so, so awareness should be behind us uh, by now. Uh, I think it's now, it's now how can we really steer on this and contribute in a positive way. 
And then I think that the green coding best practices should be taught on universities and energy aware software um, should, should be a just matter of the curricula. Uh, what, what are then the tactics you can apply or what are the, the, the topologies or architects you, architectures you, 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 you have to apply uh, to reach that? Huh? And Because uh, it's not only about software, it's also about the amount of data or the full architecture that's behind it huh? and, and, uh, and the use and requirement management. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a, there's, there's a few levers you can twist and turn to, to get influence. A good one. Laurie, you want to add something to that wish list? Yeah, well, uh, awareness, of course, is the basics. It's important that they know in which ecosystems they are evolving and that everyone has to play uh, his part and is part of the game in reducing the overall footprint of IT, whether you are the software developer, whether you will be on the cloud side, on the infrastructure, on the strategy. Um, it is a complex ecosystem. You cannot expect the other one to make the change. You will have to, to, to be part of, of that change too. Um, and I think that's the complexity that's not there yet. Maybe they are aware, but uh, IT is not something very tangible. And IT is something you really don't control, even though we think we control IT within our company. As soon as the technology comes up, there is this rebound effect that nobody can foresee. So you you, you put a technology in the market for a certain purpose and yesterday already sometime took it for another purpose and another purpose and then it just go massive and it's one of the, the fields across all of them if we talk fashion, agriculture, whatever, IT is keep increasing so much just because it's out of control. And where the Paris Agreement asks us to reduce like around 8% of our emissions every year, IT is growing up uh, eight percent per year, and nobody can control it. So I think the IT people has, have, or the IT community has to understand that when they create something, when they come up with an ID, it will be potentially be used by so many people, and this, this multiplying effects that you showed earlier this morning, uh, that should be uh, in everyone's mind. Yeah, Maybe just a short addition, um, and that's more on the technological side. We've been uh, doing uh, some lab comparisons uh, regarding te tech stacks, and I think uh, those information is like what is the impact of choosing like language one against language B in, uh, regarding resource efficiency and thereby e ecological impact. That's something that's really beneficial, um, like APIs and stuff like that, which really should be taught at least on a higher level, not on a deeper level, of course. That's way, probably way too much or just for a deepening course. But that's something that should be aware of students uh, coming from universities as well, yeah. Like benchmarks, essentially. Good. Now, I want to drill a little bit deeper. Uh, sorry, uh, too many questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we do one more and then I'll ask them a question. Yeah. Thank you. So I think it's amazing what, what you are doing in your companies. This is really great. Also that you make it transparent. Very important, I think. Um, I would be interested in hearing how did it all start in your companies? Because I can imagine that a lot of other people can maybe relate to this and get an idea how they can get started in their companies. So, so what was the very first thing? Was it strategic, like one person, or what, how, how did you get going? Yeah, I can start if you want. I mean, you know a bit of us about us, Jutta. Um, it was more or less like a grassroots movement in the beginning. Mark, who's sitting here, wrote a bachelor thesis about uh, measuring, uh, the, I think it was energy of software. And that was like the, the first stone that came into rolling. And thereafter, some people uh, started to be interested in it, luckily on a management level, uh, so management has to be part of it. Um, but very rap rapidly, we found intrinsic motivated people, as uh, Vibran already said, who were happy to jump on it, even after hours, to support the project and to identify fields of action, measures, and to work it up to understand what can we do, what's the impact and stuff like that. And once you've done that, to under you really have to understand it in the first place. Um, for your company, for your company's specific needs and uh, opportunities, and thereafter you can start to roll it out. That's how it started at our place. And the management really has to play a big role because it's quite a lot of effort. In Kevin's case, I would add that there's a very committed CEO on top of uh, industry solutions. Yeah, yeah I, I can, I can uh, support that. Uh, it started in Ebenembro in 2019, and I have to be arrogant here to say with a 
position paper that I wrote <laughs> and sent on a Friday afternoon to our CITO, which is the highest boss of, uh, of the company uh, regarding IT. And he said, and I, it was a, a paper about sustainable IT and indeed the worrying trends that, that we talk about, right? And, uh, and he, he invited me to, to his office for, for a uh, meeting and, and he said, uh, it's an interesting viewpoint, because eh? we haven't factored this into our policies or targets or a way of working. And uh, could you work it out a, f a little bit more and come back into my management team meeting? Uh, eventually, it was there half a year later, where we had an open discussion about shouldn't IT also set sustainability targets for itself? Eh? And, and, and then the bank overall had a, also a luring, uh, evolving sustainability target. It's now formalized, obviously. But back then, that the, uh, even I think IT was a forerunner in setting sustainable targets for itself. Uh, and we said the carbon reduction and a, a circularity ambition. Later on, we added energy targets, uh, three specific energy targets for our digital workplace, for our data centers, for, and for our applications overall. Um, and that we are monitoring and steering on today. Yeah? But, but indeed, it starts with, with addressing it at sea level management and making a, getting at least one sponsorship and mandate from that, from that uh, level. Um, yeah. Now, what, what is your journey? In our case, it's a very bottom-up approach. So it really started for an employee who wanted to uh, create a department around sustainable IT. Well, he had a background on energy management and also Airbus is ISO 40001 certified, where you have to have a strong environmental management system in place, where you have to look at the overall life cycle uh, approach of uh, your company, the products, etc. So he came with that idea that, okay, IT is an enabler, but IT has a footprint, and we should also look at our own life cycle uh, of, of the IT we produce. And this way it all started, and then we created a network within our IT departments on uh, so-called focal points and people that has the expertise of every single field in software, in HPC, in cloud, in data centers, in workplace, etc. So that we combine both knowledge and try to do uh, the best of it to understand the footprint and try, uh, try to reduce it. So it was a bottom-up approach and now it is something very well supported by the top management, which is also key uh, in the success of the roadmap. Nice. Sounds like a very, very convincing journey, sir. What, two times bottom up and one time with a position paper. Uh, before we go into more questions, I just want to drill down one layer is to just ask you, and I, in Laurie's case, I, I know pretty well that it's sometimes very painful to, first of all, make the initial assessment of um, how big is your IT footprint, what is, what is the environmental impact that comes from it. And I, just, I was wondering if you have any wishes towards regulators, suppliers, you know, hardware manufacturers, any of these people, um, on, on, on how you would like um, to, to get the information that you need to, to actually do these assessments? That's a very big question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so we went in all directions. So we created trainings for our employees to cover the awareness part. Uh, we did the carbon balance footprint. It was hard to find a supplier because you need both IT expertise and carbon balance footprint expertise. It's not so often that you find that in the market. Uh, but you have to know where is your footprint and where should be your, your, your big levers. Um, then we had to show the, or see the entire picture and we created an eco-design referential. So really covering all aspects of IT, uh, all, lever, uh, all layers like back and front end, infrastructure, strategy, specifications, where you could put recommendations at every stage of a development of IT to make it more, uh, more sustainable. Um, but it's very... Uh, Hand, uh, homemade uh, recipes. Why? Because there are no standards, because there are barely certifications about it, or guidelines, or regulations at all. IT is th this type of field always falling under existing regulations and they will just make it somehow happen. No, we need regulations for IT. And, and eco levels, uh, we have eco levels for a couple of hardware, and uh, we buy 80% of what we produce in IT, I would say, what we use in IT within the company, and we do ourselves 20%. When you buy 80%, you rely on the suppliers, so then you also need tools to assess your suppliers, and eco levels, for instance, or certifications, is a very good and easy mean from a procurement person 
to have a first good feeling on let's rather buy uh, uh, that one with the eco labels if you manage to put sustainability as a criteria in your RFPs. So it's like going everywhere at the same time and trying to cook your own recipe because there is nothing to help you out there. But you're in luck, the people that do the standardization in Germany, at least they're all in this room, kind of. So <laughs> maybe they hear you. Uh, Vibu, what about you? Do you have a wish list to suppliers or to, to the market or to governments? Yeah, so, so um, I think seeing our targets on carbon reduction, circularity, and energy reduction. Um, on circularity, I think the, the discussion is often about uh, the longevity of a device uh, or of the IT asset disposition, so the, the breakdown of a device and regaining of the materials to a certain extent. And, and where I really uh, urge the, this IT sector is to, on the inflow of materials, bec become much more transparent. Where do the materials come from? So the bill of material, basically, of what's in our devices. Uh, so if I know what's in a, in a, in a, in a uh, pot of... Uh, uh, of jelly uh, uh, that you put on your bread. I also want to know what's in what's in the uh, a new Dell uh, 8000 laptop. And then Dell looks at me very strange and say, well, you're not a chemist, uh, well, what do you want to know? Well, well I don't care how the, how the materials are, maybe a little bit if they're toxic, yes or no, but I also want to know where do they come from? Are they virgin materials? Are they circular materials? Huh? And so for me, that is a challenge. I've seen a few, and the methodology that we, we look for that is CTI met methodology. Maybe some of you know that, the circular transition indicators from the WBCSD. Uh, we're a little bit shifting now to the circular economy. I'm aware of that, uh, Max, but, but I think it's also a very important aspect of sustainable IT or, or uh, reducing the impact of, of digitalization. So that bill of material uh, for the sake of circularity uh, insights is, I think, very uh, uh, yeah, useful. I agree. Yeah, I think especially, I cannot stress enough, energy is one aspect, but resources is really another aspect. Yeah, I get that. Kevin, I'll let you answer as well. Wish list, suppliers, governments? Yeah, I think we are singing the same song over and over again. Um, but yeah, it's it's really like a baseline of transparency. It doesn't really have to be like that accurate, that's 100%, but uh, we've been already been talking about energy consumption, resource consumption of software, uh, which you are currently working on with your Institute and then with uh, Uber. Um, this really is like a baseline we need uh, for every software. This label you're working on, or this batch, whatever you want to call it, it really is would be very helpful um, to understand what uh, to, to, to assist consumers, but also companies, to make informed decisions regarding software procurement. That's really a big point. And um, as I said, it doesn't have to be uh, super precise. It should be more or less easy to implement into existing processes. And uh, on the other hand, is Song, same song again, it's about cloud providers, really um, transparency, what metrics, what, what metrics are behind it. They should use all the same, of course, definitely. Uh, if you have a multi-cloud um, strategy, it's really hard to compare the data and just you put data with different metrics in the same pot. So it's really like a, a guessing game if it's right or not. And you don't have a choice, it's, you don't get any better data. Yeah, I wonder if they want to be comparable. So uh, Definitely not, that's why we need <laughs> regulations. <laughs> exactly. But one question from Tom. Shoot. Yeah, um, so we deal with a lot of customers who bring these requirements to us, and one of the challenges is that they're quite often not specific about how these would factor into decision criteria for any kind of decision around it. And, and sometimes I think they don't necessarily know, to your point about you know the organization's struggle with how much value is there in being more sustainable and how do I equate that and how do I make a decision on an RFP where mostly that's being run by procurement and all those decisions are being driven by financial criteria. And I'm wondering if you see your organizations evolving to the point where these criteria start to become transparently clear across your entire value chain. So employees know w what benefit they would get from a salary standpoint if they have these skills, and vendors would know what benefit they're gonna get if Dell can make you a more circular server or if a network company can give you, a, you know, a greater benefit. And, and do you see it going in that direction? I don't mind saying, answering at least my view on that. Uh, yeah, we are moving that direction very slowly, uh, but uh, we call that the embedding of this topic of sustainability or, or green coding into our uh, way of working. And you know how IT has its processes, uh, you call IT for IT or ETIL or... Uh, so 
what you can also slowly see is that for in IT for IT there's now a sustainability management process there huh? and uh, so you, you will see that sustainability will pop up in all the processes because the processes have to sustain and underpin basically the the, the, the sustainability targets that are out there either your yeah, basically your own targets um, but but most targets uh, evolve slowly but surely to net zero and, and, and lower energy use and, and more circularity and, and some social targets um, so so I think yeah we see that uh, we call that embedding both in the IT processes as well as in the IT roles and responsibilities eh? more the Rusky side or job profile side so in none of uh, hardly in any of our job descriptions sustainability was a, uh, a bullet point right and uh, I think uh, we're moving into a, a world where, where it, it will be a bullet point and, and something you will be uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, having a discussion on in your performance dialogues. Uh, what have you done lately to, to, s to save the world, basically, right? <laughs> or to lower our footprint? If I may add, um, I think putting sustainable IT requirements in call for tenders for suppliers is not only about the answers you receive and what you do about it and uh, the way you put it in an RFP. Uh, we have only 5% right now, but you know, you have to uh, cope with all the other criteria is also important in, a, in an IT project, but it's better than not having it at, at all. But what I really hope through these requirements, it's a type of indirect awareness I do with my suppliers. And if I ask, and tomorrow Kevin asks, and then the day after Vibran asks, then they say, oh wow, they are all asking the same questions. Maybe we should report on it. Maybe we should improve on it. And that's, that's this indirect effect of, of putting requirements, because the requirements from the users will at some point lead to the standards uh, of tomorrow, because you have to answer uh, your, your, your customer needs. Uh, and you can start with the pricing of energy, you can sell it that way, that you will do energy savings if you have a, a more sustainable IT, but then you can go on the dark side, because we didn't talk a lot about the social aspect uh, of IT and, and of sustainability overall, but uh, IT has a very dark side, especially in the raw material extraction, in the child labor, in all those minings everywhere, um, because we need so many of these minerals, and in the waste management, you don't want to have, and it happens to us many years ago, you don't want to have uh, someone finding an Airbus laptop on an illegal landfill somewhere in India. Because there it causes a lot of damage of reputations and image. And you can't measure that one. You don't want to have, um, yeah, just your image associated with, uh, with a terrible picture somewhere in the world uh, of child labor. And this is also why there is also this, this supply chain uh, due diligence, which is a, a very important uh, aspect. So it, it is sometimes easy to measure, like energy savings. It is sometimes not that easy to measure, but you don't want to take the risk of, of, of that thing happening. Thank you. I think especially the, the, the minerals part, I think is something we forget about. I take one very short question, has to be short, and Kevin will get it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, yes, okay, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, on my side, um, so about equipment, hardware, uh, I do think that we can do low tech, right? I have a whole, I don't know, I think it's Intel Pentium, one gigs of RAM uh, on Linux uh, that is running basically Excel uh, and it's working, so that's nice. And so for basic office work, um, the issue is that now that the game is rigged. No? You need to update to new operating system, so you, you have operating system induced obsolescence, right? So you need new laptops because you can't support Windows 11 and so on. And so at one point, did you add in your organization yet the reflection about, hey, maybe we should go for low tech, maybe we sh it's time to get rid of, sorry to say that, but to, to Microsoft and Windows and to go for Linux and an open office, is that something that is that you speak about? Or, because, I mean, the hardware can, I mean, if it's good hardware, you can you can keep it for a, a long period of time. So it's, it's truly the fact that we, in, I mean, we need to update new operating systems. So is low tech of, of, of software and, and the tools we use, because, I mean, office work is about PowerPoint and Excel, which is, has, has been going on for 20, 30 years. So is low tech, uh, something that could be uh, in the discussion within your companies or is it 
Oh no. That's quite a tough question. Um, from a sustainability point of view, I would totally agree with you. Uh, from a consultant point of view, it's hard. From a security perspective, probably harder. Um, so my, our security department would probably just say no, no discussion at all. Um, it is quite rough. So our developers, um, as I am not one of them, so I just quote them, they always need like very performant laptops, notebooks, and mostly, uh, sometimes even MacBooks. Um, uh, so I think for us, it's not that much of an, uh, of an solution. We intend to, uh, we are incentivizing the longer usage of, of the hardware, not like just two or three years, but four or five years, depending on the warranty. Um, but to really use like old tech and shift away from Windows currently isn't in the discussion at our place, to be honest. I, don't, we, I know we don't have time, but I'm still looking at Vibun and, and Laurie if you guys want to comment on this. Yeah, I, I think it's a very uh, valid question. And so a bank, as you can, uh, you already stipulated security. Now I'm not going to hide behind that uh, because I, even though uh, a bank always looks at security uh, first uh, because uh, without trust your clients will disappear, right? Um, but it, it should also not be an excuse not to think about it. Eh? So uh, I think if it's safe and, and it has a much lower footprint, uh, if you use thin clients uh, or, or maybe just from an old device session to a, a virtual desktop somewhere and still be able to do your job. And maybe that's then not for the highest demanding, uh, let's say, users or employees within the bank, but maybe myself, probably I could work like that. Huh? So uh, I think uh, to, to may have sub separations in, in how much um, demanding uh, your, your equipment has to be could be a way to reduce the overall impact. Eh? So um, I, I do think it's a valid question. I, I do know that my CISO uh, colleagues will look very carefully to this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just 30 seconds, just a quite quick addition. Um, but what is in our power is definitely to ensure that there's a second life to hardware we can't use anymore or, or do not want to use anymore. So just because the laptops uh, aren't powerful enough for our tasks or requirements anyway, uh, we still can ensure that they are given to like AF AFD, uh, AFB, I'm not sure, in I think they're called AFB in Germany. They uh, donate them to social projects, ensure that they are being used furthermore, recycle them if they can't resell them. I'll donate them. That's something we do have in our hands, that definitely. Thank you. I, I do have to close the panel because otherwise we won't have lunch. I do have to say one thing because it came up earlier and I, I do this for a living, obviously, right? Um, so I, this, this idea that somehow software has a positive impact because it can improve processes in other industries, that may be true. But please don't, be, don't, don't use that as an excuse to do something about the software itself. Because if that's true, then, for example, the steel sector could make the same claim because all wind farms are made of steel, that somehow they have a very positive impact, but we all know that making steel is not the cleanest activity. Therefore, of course, the steel industry needs to focus on making clean steel. And so we have to do the same. Software has, of course, can save lives. It can have an amazing impact. I agree with you. But it doesn't change the fact that the software industry needs to deal with the impact of the software industry. Right? That's our job. Yeah? Thank you for the applause. You have to do it again because now I would like to say thank you to the panel. <laughs>